Tonight's lesson is going to be called the God of Justice. The God of Justice. How many of you believe He's the just God? And so we're going to talk about that um, tonight. And I don't know if we'll just call it God of Justice Part 2 or come up with another name next week. But um, this week, I'm really I'm only going to cover two verses because I really want to underline some things the way people think. Sometimes we in the church think a certain way. And so, I found out that uh, spell correct on the internet is crazy. Um, I make a statement in here that some people think a loving God could never hold someone's sins against them. And the thing keeps underlining and telling me uh, trying to I forget what it tries to change it to and I, I mean what I said leave me alone but anyway uh, we're going to take just a few moments on the, to uh, reacquaint you with last time's uh, two weeks ago because last week was Bible discussion uh, two weeks ago we talked about finding courage and they were verses 1 to 5 of this uh, first chapter of 2 uh, Thessalonians Father as we speak tonight, we just pray your Holy Spirit would guide our words and let us see how awesomely just you are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, of course, we had the hello, Paul, uh, Silvanus and Timotheus, or Paul, Silas, and Timothy, under the church of uh, the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we kept those notes down there, which... Um, told you that uh, Thessalonica, the city where the Thessalonian church was, uh, was a seaport in Macedonia, and today um, the city is, uh, I cut part of it off, my computer was giving me fits today, it was putting spaces where I didn't want spaces between sentences. And then I got to fight with them and get them out of there. You know, little gaps between sentences. Uh, if I don't want them there, they can't be there. So then I got to fight with the computer. And it was doing it all day to day. Um, and then I, it messes me up because I have to highlight several things to pull it together and hit no spacing. And um, so verse 2, I moved over with the note. Verse 2 is indented wrongly. It ought to be over there where verse 3 is. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, he's saying, Me and Silas and Timothy are writing to you Christians in Thessalonica, wishing you grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So um, he is bragging on the fact that they got the two ingredients he always looks for in Christian. Faith toward God and love toward people. Uh, Paul always made an asterisk um, by that when he seen that in folk. And he always put them on his prayer list, everyday prayer list. So here he says the same thing because I, uh, I showed you, uh, he said, your faith groweth and you have love toward one another. So I showed you his attitude about those things in Ephesians 1, 15 and 16. Where to the Ephesians he wrote, Wherefore I also, after heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So if you want to get on prayer, Paul's everyday prayer list, if, you got, if you're sick or if you've got some other need, he'll pray for you. Okay. But if you want to make his constant prayer list, he needed to see two ingredients in you. He needed to see faith in God and love for the church, love for the folk in the church, which the church is. It's the folk. So he wants you to... Them are the same. So, verse 4, So that we ourselves glory, and that word means in today's language, boast. So we ourselves boast in you in the church of the God. Or we would word it, we boast about you in the church of the God. For your patience and faith and all your perseverance and tribulations that you endure, 
which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. So he said, we're bragging on you no matter what the world throws at you. And you're suffering a lot. All kinds of persecution coming your way. No matter what the world throws at you, you keep on keeping on. And we're bragging on you. Now, when he said in verse 5, that's a manifest token, uh, manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Uh, I put a note there. There are different thoughts in verse 5 in the commentaries. Some believe it uh, to be saying that the Thessalonian believers were counted worthy of heaven because they endured their persecution. Others believe that their enduring persecution proved the genuineness of their faith and that their faith is what made them worthy of heaven. And of course, I tend to agree with the latter. We are justified by faith. Uh, the Bible is plain on that. I think the verses that follow will demonstrate that very point. And then I made a note last week. You don't wake up one morning and decide that you have so much courage that you're going to run out and find some persecution. Nobody ever does that. I'm so bold in Christ today, I'm going to go find someone who will persecute me. You don't do that. It comes your way. Persecution is something that looks for you. You don't look for it. Perhaps you don't think you have the kind of courage to stand up to persecution. Guess what? Neither do I. We don't have that kind of courage right now because we don't need it right now. The thought of ISIS capturing me is a scary thought. I don't need the courage to endure that right now because it hasn't happened. But I am convinced... I said in that note that when it is necessary to have that courage, God will close us with it. I believe that's what happened to the Thessalonian believers. I believe that's what happened to Peter and the other apostles. I believe that's what happened to Stephen. I believe that's what happened to the teenage girl in Columbine. And I believe that's what's happening to Christians today in the Middle East. I also believe that's what will happen to us if the time comes when we need that kind of courage. God will close us with it. It will be a supernatural courage. Now on to this week's lesson, the God of justice. Verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So up in verses um, 4 and 5, he's talking about how much they're suffering persecution. Now in verse 6, he said the righteous thing for a righteous God to do is recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now, almost every Bible program has this, and I have a couple of Bible programs that have it. You can click on, one of them is in my phone, um, you can click on King James Light in my phone, and it just gives you the King James the way we read it. Or if you just click on King James, it will have all the Greek word numbers. After each word, there will be a strong number uh, that identifies what that Greek word means. It will use strong numbers in Thayer's dictionary definition. And uh, so I use that just to look up. Um, it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So those two words that I've underlined there, tribulation, trouble, are from the same root word in the Greek. It would be as though I would say, I am going to hurt you because you've been hurting me. Just different tenses of the same word. So in some of the modern translations, they keep it that way so we can see the uh, connection. The Good News Bible said, God will do with what is right. He will bring suffering on those who make you suffer. So you see the play in words there. They're doing this to you, so God will do this to them. And that's the idea of the word recompense. The word recompense in the Greek means in a good sense to repay or requite. In a bad sense, penalty and vengeance. In other words, judge not or you'll be judged. With what measure you give out, you it will be meted to you. So the idea is sowing and reaping. So Paul's saying, you guys are suffering, and a righteous God will catch up with your persecutors. That guy who shot that teenage girl in Columbine, 
died that same day. I think self-inflicted gunshot, if I remember right. But, um, which means he's already stood face to face with God. A righteous God will recompense, Paul says. These ISIS folk who are killing Christians are going to stand before God who Paul said it's a righteous thing for God to recompense trouble to those who are troubling you. It's a payback. It's what righteousness demands. All right, so... You see it under there, Matthew 7, 1 and 2, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, what do many people believe today, including many Christians, when it comes to God judging people? They believe God is a loving God, a forgiving God. Certainly God will not judge the sinner in the next life. God is too loving for that. There are many, I mean, that's certainly the political correct attitude to have. Everybody gets to go to heaven. Well, when Nelson sings a song, I can get to heaven just as fast as you. And he's absolutely right. As long as you go through the same door I went through. And that door is Jesus. There is no other way to heaven. You don't get to heaven because you sing a song, you can get there as fast as I do. You get to heaven because you walk through the door. Amen? You got in this room because you walked through that door. Yeah. There's no other way right now into this room than that door. Right. Unless you have some dynamite. Uh, this, right now it's the only way into this room. So, it's a wonderful song. Mind, is it Mind Your Own Business? Is that the song? Uh, don't Be Minded Mind. It's a wonderful song. I like the song. Yeah. But it's a stupid message. Anybody can get to heaven as fast as I can. All they have to do is walk through the same door I walk through. Yep. There's nothing special about me. I'm not going to heaven because I'm better than Willie Nelson. I'm going through uh, to heaven because I wa- walked through the door and Jesus said I'm the door. Alright? So, people think God will not judge the sinner in the next life. Uh, again, a gal that I work with, um, she's one of the part-timers there with Michael and I. And sometimes she'll come and break with us when we're having a break. And we were talking about something. Now, Michael is a Catholic, and he believes that we all got to pay for our sins somehow, a little bit of uh, good works, a little bit of uh, purgatory. And so he's that extreme. And she's the other extreme. Oh, everybody will go to heaven because God's a loving God. Those were her words. God forgives everybody. All right? So, many people believe that, and I think more and more people in the church, and I don't mean the uptown church, I mean the evangelical church. More people in the church today than ever before think a loving God would never send anyone to hell. Ever. So, they are saying, we're all going to heaven. All right. So what do they believe? They believe God is a loving God will not judge the sinner in the next life. What do many people believe, including many Christians, when it comes to a judge in one of our city courtrooms, sentencing someone who has murdered others, raped others, or tortured others, especially children? What do we think about that judge? We think that judge better sock it to them. Isn't it funny? We don't have that attitude about the judge. We don't think the judge ought to be a loving judge and forgive that rapist. The guy that just mowed down 16 people for the kicks of it. We think that judge ought to just forgive them. Now, don't get me wrong. There are a few judges that if they could figure a way to do it, would. Because they don't believe in penalty. But we the folk... If some child, is, especially when children are involved, some child has been abused or hurt or killed, we want vengeance as a society. We want recompense. Right? Justice demands it. Somebody runs around abusing children and then killing them should not 
Matter of fact, I think 17 years in prison of appeals before you get the death sentence is stupid. Because by that time, the do-gooders all forgot the pain of the child being dead, and now they just see a victim in there for 17 years in prison. Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? He suffered enough. He shouldn't die. The Constitution says we have a right to a speedy trial. We should have speedy justice. Once, uh, especially on this day and age, with DNA comes into play quicker. When we know somebody did it, maybe wait a while, maybe a year, in case uh, the lawyers think it's something we hadn't thought of yet for an appeal. But this idea of making appeals for all those years is crazy. Justice demands that whatever the penalty is in whatever state, life in prison without parole or the death penalty, justice demands that that individual pay that price, right? We understand that. How many of you know we're having to build new prisons? Uh, right now we got people letting uh, uh, people out of prison, some of them hardened criminals, because the cri- prisons are overcrowded. And there are many politicians today who think Building more prisons isn't the answer. Once they've been in prison a while, let them out. I tell you what, pedophiles will be pedophiles in most cases without a strong conversion till the day they die. And you're going to let them back out? Most rapists, unless they are totally born again, will remain rapists till the day they die. And so we're just turning them loose. Most killers who get a kick out of it will keep getting a kick out of it. And we turn them loose. We need to punish sin. Justice, crime in this case. Justice demands it. We understand that mostly as a society, although um, the far left is going crazy on it nowadays, but usually we understand that. So, they believe, sock it to them, judge. Give them the maximum. Justice demands it. Isn't it amazing that we believe a judge who is a sinner himself has the right and the duty to punish the criminals. But we believe that a holy God who has never sinned should overlook the sin of mankind. Isn't that amazing? Flip her over there. Why do you think that is? We have a tendency to think that the criminal in our society is vastly worse than we are. So he should have to pay for his crimes. However, you and I and our friends and neighbors are really nice people. Aren't we nice people? And should never have to face the consequences of our action. Isn't it funny the way we think? There are degrees of crimes. Bank robberies worse than speeding. How many of you would agree with that? Yeah. Hurting a child is worse than robbing a bank. Murder is almost to the top, but I would put above murder torture before the murder. Some things are worse than others. Chances are you'll never spend a night behind bars if you go 75 in a 70 speed limit zone. Because we see different crimes differently, right? And the reason we do is because we all think we're good people. And what we do is no big thing. What we do. But you see, we're dealing with a God who has never sinned and has never tolerated sin. Ever. He's perfectly holy, and with God, justice demands that every sin must be recompensed without exception. No sin gets by God. You know what's really amazing? People think uh, we shouldn't face uh, consequences. What's really amazing about all this is the answer to our first question, where um, 
why are we, um, the first question was on the other side, uh, what, what do many people believe uh, they, uh, about God, uh, including many Christians, when it comes to God judging people? I said, what's amazing about that, the answer to the first question suggests that many think that God is too loving to judge it for sin. Guess what? He doesn't want to. He's so loving that He doesn't want to judge us. However, justice demands it. I think you're all aware that every judge is a flesh and blood human being. And a lot of judges don't always do what's right. Like some illegal around here that you remember, Barb, we stopped in the street corner uh, um, by um, um, the furniture store on Broadway, not uh, Broadway and Eight, and um, their child was killed by an illegal alien from Mexico who had, was driving drunk or something, killed their child, their teenager or young adult, I forget, and a judge. Is one of those people who think, well, um, okay, we're going to set up a court date and I'm going to release you on your own recognizance. He disappeared. No justice. So this man and woman lost their child and this guy's running free somewhere because a stupid judge said, we'll release you on your own recognizance. He had no business being here, which means he had no business driving here, which means there was no way he should have been killing somebody. Now, accidents can happen to anyone, but if you shouldn't be here, you can't kill someone here unless you are here when you shouldn't be here. That make sense to you? So, some judges do stupid things. They're not consistent. One reason they're not consistent is because they're people. Another reason they're not consistent is they're driven by certain political ideologies. God is terribly consistent. He is always what He is, without exception. So He's got this thing, He really doesn't want to punish me. But justice demands it. A just God must punish sin. So how can a loving God who wants to forgive me set justice aside so He can forgive me? If He does that, then isn't He by definition unjust? So here's a just God who's a loving God who really doesn't want to kick me into hell. But if He doesn't kick me into hell, then He's not being just. By definition, He's unjust. Alright? Look at Ephesians 4.32. And be you kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now what do we see in those two verses? A just God must punish sin. If He doesn't, then He isn't a just God. But He is a just God. Therefore He has and he will punish sin. So what do I mean when I say he has and he will punish sin? Look at John one twenty nine and Hebrews 10.14. The next day John sees Jesus coming on to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Hebrews 10.14, For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. The contemporary English version of that, By his one sacrifice he has forever set people free, or set free from sin the people he brings to God. Easy to read version, With one sacrifice Christ made his people perfect forever. They are the ones who are being made holy. Good news Bible. With one sacrifice then he has made perfect forever those who are purified from sin. So what do we learn from this? What do I mean when I say He has and He will punish sin? God has punished sin by laying the guilt on the world on the back of His Son. He now offers forgiveness to everyone who, is, who will receive that free gift by receiving Jesus. God will punish sin 
That's the has punished sin. God will punish sin at the great white throne judgment by punishing all those who refuse to receive His free gift of salvation. Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient to save me and you and whosoever else will come. John said He took away the sins of the world. He paid a price that satisfied a just God to the extent that every living human being could be forgiven by simply embracing what Jesus did for them. So the father is like the the loving father. You know, how many of you know the parable of the prodigal son? I like what a preacher said one time. He said they named that parable wrong. It's not a parable about a prodigal son. The parable is a parable of a loving father. They didn't believe Jesus should be hanging with a certain crowd. So Jesus told a parable to show how loving Father God was. By illustrating a terribly rebellious child who fell into the depth of rebellion, took his inheritance, spent it all, and ended up the worst place a Jew could ever end up, feeding pigs and living with the pigs fell as far as you could fall. No Jew would have wanted anything to do with him except one, the father who stood looking down the road that his son left on every day, hoping his son would come home. That's a parable about the father, not the son. Finally, the son came to his senses and came home. That's the illustration Jesus was saying. A loving God paid a sufficient price by offering His Son at Calvary to pay for everybody's sin. And He stands watching for people to come. That's the story Jesus was telling. He stands watching for people to come. He doesn't want to punish anybody. He's a loving God and He doesn't want to punish anybody. So he paid a penalty himself that was large enough to satisfy the justice of a just God where every man, woman, boy, and girl on this planet could be saved and go to heaven. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But rebellious people say, no, no, I'll just be good myself. I'll just be good myself. God will accept that. I don't want that Christian stuff. I'll just be better than my neighbor and God will see that I'm better than my neighbor. The problem is God demands perfection. You and I can't measure up. So we got to come through the perfect one, Jesus. No other way there. So God offers to whosoever will, come. I paid the price, all you have to do is come through the door. And you'll never be judged for your sin. Ever. But if you don't come through the door, then you're left alone to stand before God. A just God must punish sin. The sad thing is, those who die without forgiveness don't die because there was no salvation afforded them. They die because they didn't embrace that salvation How do you embrace the forgiveness of your sins? By putting your faith in the sacrifice for your sins, Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Say, come on in. All right? So, God will either either punish your sin at Calvary, which is where He punished mine, or at the great white throne judgment. And if you read that story in Revelation 20, you won't like the end. Death and hell will give up the dead. And if their names aren't written in the Lamb's book of life, the angels will cast them into the lake of fire. So we can get politically correct all we want, but a just God has told us how the story ends. Your sin is going to be punished either in the person of His Son by the sacrifice He made, or you're going to be punished yourself. That's what the Scripture teaches. Verse 7, 
Well, first, um, looking back at verse 6, since we had so long before the first verse we read verse 6, I'm putting verse 6 up there again. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. In other words, the people persecuting you will be persecuted by God. Verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be, be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. Easy to read version. And He will bring relief to you who are troubled. He will bring it to you and to us when the Lord Jesus comes from heaven for all to see, together with His powerful angels. So what is verse 7 saying to you and I when we look at it along with verse 6? It's a righteous thing for God to visit trouble on those who trouble you. You're the apple of God's eye. It is also a righteous thing for God to recompense rest or relief to you who are experiencing that trouble now. How many of you know this journey that you and I are on called life can be terribly exhausting at times. Full pain, either physical, emotional, mental, whatever. Full pain. It's not always easy walking this journey. But Paul says... In the cases where there are some that are piling on and causing the pain, unless they go through the door, Jesus, the trouble they cause God's children will be recompensed to them. God, give me the love that Stephen had when he was being stoned to death. And pray, Lord, lay not this into their charge. I don't want anyone to suffer before holy God for anything they've ever done to me. Ever. Jesus didn't. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Stephen said, don't lay this sin to their charge. All right? So, when will the unregenerate or the unsaved receive their due recompense and the redeemed their due rest? This will happen when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. Revelation 21, 1-4 And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them. And they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Something I always bring out at funerals, not always, but most of the time. God doesn't promise to wipe away our tears in this life. How many of you have done some crying over the years? I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. But unless you drop dead in this service, you're probably going to do some more crying. Life has a way of causing sad things to happen. There is absolutely no promise that God will wipe your tears away in this life. But we do have a promise that He will wipe away our tears in the next life.